All right, uh, welcome to the Comstock video seminar. Um, uh, in uh, difficult times, but uh, I couldn't think of something totally appropriate to say today, so I won't. I think uh, the situation is clear enough. Um, so we have two speakers, as we always have. Um, well, you will see there are some exceptions sometimes. You're going to find out at the end of today's session. And um, so two speakers, 20 minutes each, 10 minutes questions uh, after the speaker. Um, uh, you are welcome to start asking your question already during the talk, and you do that by typing them into the chat, uh, a bit like this. And if you label it with the word question at the beginning or uppercase, it would be easier for us to notice that this is a question rather than, for example, an answer. So if you have an answer to somebody else's question, you can also type that in already. But if you just have a comment, you can also do that. And then after, 20, after the 20 minutes, we have 10 minutes for questions where we will uh, get answers to those questions you typed in and maybe additional questions that you will come up with then. Um, Bayrut, you can start sharing your slides with us already. So our first speaker is uh, Bayrut Suksompong. He's Assistant Professor of Computer Science at the National uh, University in Singapore. And um, he's worked um, some time ago on tournaments, which you may have seen some of his work, and he's done a lot of work uh, on fair division. And today it's also about fair division, in particular about the picking sequences model. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to his talk. I would go ahead. Okay, um, so thanks Ole, very much for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, uh, organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And of course, thanks everyone for uh, joining in today. So this uh, work is a joint work with uh, Mitun Chakaborty from University of Michigan and uh, Ulrike Schmidt-Krepelin from uh, TU Berlin. So it was presented at the ISCHI last year. The full version appeared in Artificial Intelligence Journal. And toward the end, I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, some recent uh, follow-up work as well. OK, so imagine the following situation. Right? Suppose after, the, uh, after a national election, the parties that form a coalition government need to decide among themselves how to allocate the ministries. Right? So the question is, how can they obtain the fairness in this allocation based on both uh, their preferences and the votes that they got uh, in the election. So two basic fairness notions are envy freeness and proportionality. Envy freeness says that the party A should find its bundle to be at least as good as party B's bundle. And the proportionality says that because there are three parties, party A should receive value at least uh, one third of its value for the entire set of uh, ministries. Now, clearly these notions do not work in the setting where different parties or agents have different weights which uh, represent their entitlements. And this is not just a problem with the ministry allocation, but also when we allocate supplies to districts, organizations, university departments, and so on, because these, ent these uh, entities typically have uh, different sizes. Now, fortunately, both uh, envy freeness and proportionality can be generalized uh, to accommodate weights. So we have weighted envy freeness, which says that uh, party A should find its bundle at least twice as good as party B's bundle, because A's weight is twice as much as B's weight. And the propor weighted proportionality says that because party A has 60% of the votes, party A should receive value at least 60% of its value for the entire set of uh, ministries. Now for indivisible items like ministries, we need to relax these notions further because it could be that there's one ministry that's really, really important. And so we have a uh, weighted envy freeness up to one item, which was proposed in an earlier paper by Mitun, Ayumi Karashi, myself, and uh, Yair Zik and the weighted proportionality up to one item, which was proposed by Haris Aziz, Abe Mulan, and Fedor Sandomierski. Now, an important class of algorithms in fair division, and item allocation in general, is the class of picking sequences. The well-known picking sequence is the round-robin algorithm, where the agents just take turns at picking their favorite items, A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on, until the items run out. Now, picking sequences have several advantages. They're intuitive, they can be implemented efficiently, and they help preserve privacy because only the picks need to be revealed as opposed to the entire uh, preferences. So several apportionment methods can be formulated as picking sequences, where apportionment is a special case of uh, weighted fair division where all items are identical, right? for example, seats in the parliament. And an example of uh, apportionment method is Adam's method. So for Adam's method, the next pick at each stage would go to an agent I who minimizes the ratio between TI and WI. 
where Ti is the number of picks that agent I has made so far, and Wi is agent I's weight. So in this example, Adam method would go A, B, C, A, A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, C, and so on. And it's known that the output allocation of uh, this method is always uh, satisfies WF1, but not necessarily uh, W prop one. Now, picking sequences have been used to allocate ministries uh, in Northern Ireland and Denmark, and Adam's method is not the only picking sequence, far from it. So there's a whole class of uh, picking sequence based on uh, the cl apportionment class of uh, divisor apportionment methods. Right? So these class uh, of methods uh, seek to minimize uh, some function f of ti over wi, where this uh, f is somewhere between t and uh, t plus one. So Adam's method has f t equals t, Jefferson's method has f t equals t plus one. So these are the two extremes. And then Webster takes uh, the average, so the arithmetic mean. Hill takes uh, the geometric mean, and Dean uh, takes the harmonic mean. So these are the five uh, traditional divisor methods. So they give rise to uh, picking sequences. Now, okay, so for fairness notions, I mentioned the weighted EF1. So this says that for every pair of agents I and J, the weighted NV of I towards J can be eliminated if we remove at most one item from J's bundle. Now there's a weak version of that, which uh, instead of I is removing one, one item from J's bundle, I could also copy an item from J's bundle into I's bundle. So I has a choice between uh, these two options. Weighted prop one says that an agent may fall short of uh, being weighted proportional, but not by too much. Right? So not by, not by more than the value of some item outside of uh, that agent's bundle. So our first contribution is that we give uh, characterizations of uh, picking sequences that satisfy each of these uh, fairness notions. Of the five uh, traditional divisor methods, all of them satisfy weak weighted EF1. So this gives a concrete way in which uh, all these methods uh, provide fairness in the setting of uh, weighted fair division. Now, Adams is the only one that satisfies weighted EF1, and uh, Jefferson is the only one that satisfies weighted prop one. Now, we can do something much more general than this. So we defined uh, the class of uh, divisor methods, which we call the weighted power mean divisor methods. So the idea here is that we want to take uh, and somehow the average uh, between t and t plus one. Right? So we do so by uh, taking the power mean. So this power is p as uh, so it's a parameter. And then there's also a parameter w. So that is the weight uh, that we put on between uh, t and t plus one. So we have uh, this formula for p not equal to zero. And then when p equals to zero, uh, we take the limit uh, of this formula. So it becomes uh, the geometric mean, uh, weighted geometric mean between t and uh, t plus one. Now, if, t, if p equals one, uh, we have uh, the class of stationary divisor method, right? So we have that the f of t equals uh, t plus c. So this includes the atoms so f t equals t, uh, Jefferson f t equals t plus one, and the Webster uh, f t equals uh, t plus a half. If w is a half, uh, then we have a class of uh, power mean divisor methods, right? So here we have that the f of t is uh, the power mean between t and t plus one. And if we take uh, p, p to be minus one, then we'll get the uh, dean. And then for the case of p equal to zero, uh, we'll get hill. So this class of uh, weighted power mean divisor methods contain all five uh, traditional divisor methods, but it contains uh, many more uh, divisor methods as well. So we show that the all weighted power mean divisor methods uh, satisfy weak uh, weighted EF1. And still, even in this much larger class, Adams is the only divisor method to satisfy weighted EF1. And the Jefferson is the only divisor method uh, to satisfy weighted prop one. Okay, so for the uh, Bill's question, so it's about additivity assumptions. So indeed, uh, for these uh, results, we, we do need to assume additivity. And that is even true for, for in the unweighted setting for round robin algorithm uh, satisfies EF1. Even that for that result, uh, we do need to assume that uh, the agents have additive valuations over the items. Okay, so um, besides fairness, another important class of uh, properties uh, is a, a monotonicity properties. So resource monotonicity says that if we add an extra item, then no agent should become worse off. If we add an extra agent, then no original agent should become better off. And if uh, we increase the weight of an agent, then that agent should not become worse off. Now you may think that these notions are so basic that any reasonable uh, algorithm, right, any reasonable rule should satisfy them, but that's actually not the case. So we have counter examples showing that the uh, well-known algorithms like uh, maximum Nash welfare 
and B cycle elimination or adjusted winner actually fail even just resource monotonicity. So these properties are not as trivial as they may seem. And we showed that the divisor methods have performed quite well with respect to these properties. So every divisor method uh, satisfies resource and population monotonicity. They also satisfy uh, weight monotonicity in the case of two agents. However, all five traditional divisor methods uh, fail weight monotonicity in the case of uh, three agents. Okay, so back to fairness. So I mentioned uh, that the weighted EF1 doesn't imply weighted prop one. So the situation is even worse than that. Right? So these two notions are sometimes incompatible. There are instances where no allocation is both weighted EF1 and weighted prop one. And that's something really strange, really unintuitive, because in the unweighted setting, EF1 implies prop one. And even in the weighted setting, weighted NV freeness implies weighted proportionality. So if we look at the definition of weighted EF1, right? So this is the definition. We remove one item, but agent I is allowed to remove one item from J's bundle. And uh, we rearrange the terms, then we have this, uh, this uh, bound on the NV, right? Upper bound on the NV that I may have toward J. And this, upper, this is upper bounded by UI of G divided by WJ. If you think about it from the point of view of uh, symmetry, there's really no reason by the, why this uh, red term should be WJ, right? Why not WI? And in, in, in fact, uh, if WI is greater than WJ, then agent I would rather have this term be WI than WJ, because that would give a stronger bound, right? a, a lower uh, guaranteed envy. So what we did uh, in a recent uh, follow-up work, which uh, was presented at AAAI uh, last month, and this is with uh, Mitun and uh, Errol Segal Halevi, is that we generalized uh, WF1 to a spectrum right, uh, of uh, WF relaxations, which we call WF X comma Y where the relevant case here is uh, when x plus y is equal to one. So what we do is that uh, we take the average uh, between, weighted average between one over wj and one over wi. Right? So this gives a balance uh, between lower weight agents and higher weight agents. So a large x would give a notion that favors lower weight agents, whereas a large y uh, gives a notion that favors uh, higher weight agents. So wef10 is just a wf1. And uh, for any x and y summing to one, WFXY strengthens a uh, weak weighted EF1, uh, right, for any of these uh, x values of x, x and y. So we can define uh, also pro W prop y, W prop xy, uh, using similar principles. And you'll see that uh, W prop one is W prop zero one. And for any xy, WFXY implies W prop xy. So now we do have this uh, implication relation. And this gives an explanation of why WEF1 doesn't imply W prop one, right? that's because WEF1 is WF10, whereas W prop one is W prop zero one. So it also gives, uh, this also gives a resolution uh, to this issue. Now, okay, we've defined all these uh, notions. Uh, can they be satisfied? Right, so um, in, indeed they can. Uh, so for any uh, X between zero and one, uh, the divisor method with uh, F of T equals to T plus one minus X satisfies WF X one minus X and consequently also W prop X one minus X. And it's the only divisor method to satisfy either of these notions. So okay, all these notions uh, can be satisfied. And uh, if you think of in terms of uh, balance, right, the Webster method, because it takes the X equal to a half, it gives an intuitively, it gives a natural compromise between high weight and low weight agents. And now you might say, okay, like uh, we can satisfy that we have X one minus X for any value of X. Why not satisfy like more than one value simultaneously? Well, it turns out that that uh, is impossible. So for any X different from X prime, uh, that we have X one minus X and uh, X prime one minus X prime cannot always be satisfied simultaneously. So this trade off between higher weight agents and lower weight agents uh, is inevitable, okay? Okay, so um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, picking sequences uh, have been used to allocate ministries uh, in uh, uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Denmark. So another in interesting application of uh, picking sequences occurs in the German parliament, uh, this allocation of uh, Vossitz Posten or uh, committee chairs. So this is, an, uh, uh, this is an excerpt from a German newspaper uh, from uh, last year, so December, 2021. Uh, after their national election, they need to allocate these uh, committee chairs. And uh, here I provide a translation. So the chair positions are filled uh, in order according to the group size. So this time it was the SPD, SPD's turn first, then the union, Greens, and FDP came, 
before the AFD could pick for the first time. After that, the SPD and Union had their second and also third turns before the Greens were allowed to pick for the second time and the small left uh, for the first time, followed by the FDP second pick and so on until everything was distributed. So it's clear that they're using a picking sequence here, right? But which picking sequence? And we know that there are many picking sequences to choose from, just a class of divisor methods, in fact, an infinite number of them. So here's another uh, article uh, from uh, Germany. This is from uh, 2018, after their 2017 uh, national election. So the agreement on the allocation of the chairs was not reached by consensus in the Council of Elders, as was previously the case. Instead, the leaders of the parliamentary groups agreed to use the Jean Laguet Chapers method to determine the choice of chairs. So they're allowed to choose in turn which committee they want to chair according to a certain formula. And the Jean Laguet Chapers is just another name, it's a European name for Webster. So what they use is uh, Webster. And this is interesting, right? Because as I mentioned, as uh, so Webster intuitively seems to give a balance between higher weight agents and lower weight agents. So this, and this is actually what, uh, what is used, at least in this application. Okay, so I hope that I've convinced you that the picking sequences are really interesting and they can be used and are used uh, in, in, uh, in applications. So let me just conclude with uh, a few uh, future directions. So the first question is, do Hill and Dean satisfy fairness notions beyond uh, weak weighted E of 1? So we've seen that uh, this is true for Adams, Jefferson, and uh, Webster, right? Because WEF X comma Y uh, provide this kind of uh, stronger notion, stronger fairness guarantee than we weighted E of 1. But for Hill and Dean, because these functions uh, are nonlinear, uh, even though there's some kind of analog that we could uh, try to define, uh, apparently it, uh, it doesn't work. So we haven't been able to get this uh, to work. Defining analogs of WF X1 minus X for nonlinear functions F seems to be challenging. Second question is, can we get all monotonicity along with say weak uh, weighted E of one? So right, remember that uh, remember that uh, for picking sequences, uh, they satisfy resource and population monotonicity, but uh, they satisfy weight monotonicity only for two agents, right? They fail it for three agents. And if we want just want uh, all monotonicity, well, that's trivial because we can just uh, allocate all items to a fixed agent, or we can also try running unweighted round robin with a fixed ordering, right? I mean, if we, if we do that, then we do get the all monotonicity, but clearly because we ignore the weights, we're not going to get any kind of uh, weighted fairness. So can we get all these properties, right, all monotonicity plus some kind of fairness? And the final question that I want to mention is, uh, is even about in the unweighted setting, right? So is there a rule that satisfies you have one trade of optimality and uh, either resource or population monotonicity or both of them? Right? So um, if you look at the maximum Nash welfare, so that's uh, known to be EF1 and Pareto optimality, but uh, it fails both the resource and population monotonicity. Whereas for round robin, so it's EF1, uh, it's uh, as we've seen, uh, it's uh, both resource and population monotonic, but it's not Pareto optimal. And if we allocate all items to a fixed agent, well, that's the uh, Pareto optimal and uh, monotonic, but it's uh, clearly not the uh, EF1. So we can get two out of uh, these three properties, but can we get all three, right? So that's a really interesting question. Okay, so um, let me end here. Uh, thanks for listening and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So I suggest we unmute ourselves for a short round of applause. Short but intense, of course. All right. Um, uh, if I'm seeing everything correctly, yes, we had only this one clarification question during the talk, which has been answered. Um, are there other people who would like to ask questions? You can raise your hands and I will uh, just ask something simple. Um, that's not very central to your work, but that just uh, caught my attention quite at the beginning. Um, at some point you defined a weak notion, I think of the EF of the weighted EF1. Uh, which which was instead of deleting an item from the other agents uh, bundle, you said you copy it. So does that mean you you keep that uh, item and the other agents bundle and put an additional copy into your own, or does it mean you move it across? Right, so, 
So if we allow to move the item, then that that, that gives us a, an even weaker notion of EF1. So here we, we are uh, we are still doing something uh, stronger. We guarantee making a stronger guarantee by just allowing an agent to move, oh, sorry, to copy the item, but not to delete uh, the item from the other agent's bundle. Yeah. So I was wondering, in what sense the copying is really weaker than the original thing? Because like removing a really um, yeah, I don't know. The removing could that not have a bigger impact than, uh, or removing a great item maybe has a bigger impact than copying a not so great item. Or, or um, yeah. So, so like which one is uh, weaker or stronger? Right? Like whether uh, removing or copying is stronger actually depends on the agent's uh, relative weight, because if you look at the definition of uh, weighted EF one, right? So um, this is the definition with uh, with uh, uh, removing an item. So if uh, the agent, if agent I has lower weight, agent I would, uh, you know, prefer to remove an item, where, whereas uh, if the a would, right, agent I would prefer WF1. So I mean, intuitively WF1, right, if say there are 100 agents and 100 items, and uh, you know, like maybe the agents have like very, very different weights, WF1 is gonna say that everyone should get the one item. And I mean, in some sense, this is really unfair, right? Because maybe one agent has weight one, another agent has weight like a million, and then all these 100 items are identical. Then it's still going to say that uh, everyone should get one item. So this uh, favors the uh, uh, lower weight agents, whereas for the uh, copying definition, that's going to favor uh, higher weight uh, mm. agents. So that's uh, the trade-off that occurs. And uh, and you know you can see that this uh, this in the unweighted setting, this is not an issue because uh, WI and WJ are, are all equal, so these terms are cancelled. So it doesn't matter whether you uh, you remove or copy. Yeah. Thank you. Clear. Um, now we have several questions uh in the chat i'm going to pick uh i think the first one is uh peter you can briefly unmute yourself and ask your question yes thank you very interesting talk but i was wondering whether what happens if you investigate mechanisms which evolve involve some form of randomization and you are looking at the average quality of outcome Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean we we haven't thought about that. So so that's a direction that's been taken by some uh, fair division papers. But uh, yeah, most uh, you know most papers, including ours, uh, just consider uh, deterministic outcomes. So um, yeah, I don't have anything immediate to say about that. Okay, thanks. And then we have Sid next. You can unmute yourself. Hey, yeah, met a nice approach. So this is the result called the Belinsky Young theorem, which says that like, if you have both, if you require both sorts, I guess it says if you want to respect quotas, avoid monotonicity, non-monotonicities of both kinds, then it's impossible. Like it's an impossibility. There's no picking. I mean, I guess no apportionment would do that. So does does that apply here? Um. I think in that literature, it's referred to as the Alabama paradox and the population paradox. So, okay, so so I'm not uh, I'm not familiar enough uh, with that uh, to answer. Yeah, so I mean here, right? So one thing that uh, I can mention that's uh, you know re related is uh, with respect to this uh, quota, right? So there's a known result, I think, also by Balinski and Young that uh, no uh, divisor method can respect both the upper and lower quota, and so they propose right. this uh, method the quota method and so we also study that with respect to uh, these uh, fairness and monotonicity notions uh -huh. oh okay so my question was the there's no like reduction from like you can't set weights such that if you have w like any sort of weighted at ef1 that would imply a quota so like these two are different in some sense um, so I think if uh, the items, right, if you look at the identical item setting, right, so our setting, weighted fair division setting would reduce to um, apportionment. And indeed, like weighted prop one is very closely related to uh, to um, lower quota. So it, right. it could be that uh, some uh, negative result from uh, apportionment would also apply to uh, to our setting because it's just uh, with identical items. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, thanks. And uh, Justin. Um, hi, great talk. Uh, I was going to ask, do you have any idea of what kind of algorithm would give all three monotonicity properties and weak weighted EF1? Uh, is it possible that some picking sequence would do this or should we be looking elsewhere? 
Right. So um, yeah, we, I don't I don't really know. So I mean, right. What I know, what I mentioned is that uh, so all five traditional divisor methods uh, fail uh, with monotonicity uh, for three agents. So even within the class of uh, divisor methods, right. So we don't have a characterization of which ones uh, would fail or satisfy uh, weight monotonicity uh, beyond two agents. So we don't have a good understanding about that. And beyond divisor methods, uh, yeah. So I don't uh, have an idea of which algorithms would uh, could work. Thanks. And Bill? Yeah, so for, for example, imagine we had three agents and one was given two thirds of the weight and the other one third of the weight. What happens if we take the one with two thirds of the weight and pretend she is actually two um, people with one third of the weight each, and then you could treat it as equal, uh, create a picking sequence. Does that get any of the properties you're looking for? Yeah, I think if we do that, you know, because of uh, this uh, up to one good relaxation, right? Uh, if you break an item into two, uh, Break an agent into two agents, then you could the the guarantee that you could get uh, I think could be uh, weaker because then you it's like a, it's up I to one item weaken, for each agent and be up to two. You'd weaken the you'd weaken the EF. Um, right. Yeah, I think what EF one definition, the EF, but, exactly. but maybe you'd achieve some other things that you couldn't otherwise achieve. Um, okay, I'm not sure whether we would, we would achieve something stronger because at least like for the high weight agents, you break into like many, many agents that, and you just you know, yeah. apply this, uh, uh, the guarantees from the weighted setting, right? Then, then you would have to, or, or the unweighted setting, then you would lose kind of one item for every uh, agent. And even if you have like say, you know, seven agent, like, you know, maybe one agent has weight three over seven, the other has like four over seven, you have to break into quite a lot of uh, agents and I think uh, what you get if you apply, try to apply results from uh, the unweighted setting would be a weaker uh, guarantee in terms of uh, you know, envy freeness. Right, thanks. Nice, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, Omar, do you want to um, explain what you wrote or is it? Uh... No, it's, it's, not a, it's not a question to, or it was, had to do with uh, Seedhart's uh, comment that uh, some, there are some possibilities on allocation methods. I would just, I just wasn't sure what he was referring to. I mentioned one of them that I'm familiar with from, uh, from a paper from a couple of years ago. Um, but it, uh, I, again, I wasn't completely sure what Seedharf was aiming for. So it just commented on one impossibility that definitely exists on these allocation methods. Okay, do we have a final question from anyone? Or was that the final, not a question, but a common thing. All right, that's, uh, that's great. And thank you very much once more. Uh, it was a very nice talk indeed. Um, we're going to go into the break in a moment, but we'll first have one uh, brief announcement. So um, as many of you hopefully have noticed, next week will be the deadline for the meeting, for the, if you want to give a talk at the meeting uh, for social choice and welfare, which will be in Mexico a few months later. And uh, Andre Gomberg, I think is here. I saw him arrive earlier and he um, is organizing the conference and he can tell us briefly something about it. Are you here, Andre? Yes, yes, I'm here. Right. Uh, so thanks, Sula, for letting me uh, barge in for a second. Uh, so yes, uh, the deadline uh, so far, at least for the moment, is March 15th for the uh, Social Choice and Welfare regular meetings, hopefully in person in Mexico City. So uh, we are planning to do this hybrid. So if you are not sure you will be able to travel, Please submit nevertheless. Uh, so, but we hope, so the meetings were supposed to be in Mexico two years ago. We were forced to hold them online. So hopefully we're returning to the normalcy. And uh, I would like to see all of you guys in Mexico. Thank you very much. I will just add a short explanation for the computer scientists amongst us. So this is an economics conference. It's different from how we are used to doing it. So there will be no serious reviewing of your paper. It's basically you indicate, I would like to give a talk. Uh, and then they will usually let you give a talk. And uh, I've been there a few times and I always found it very, very nice and very inspiring. And uh, also it can be very big actually. Um, I don't know how big we're gonna manage to get it this time, but hopefully some of you will be there, so. Yes, just seconding what Ula has said, uh, this is uh, the main social choice society for economists. And uh, we, so the normal size of the uh, conference has been about 200, 250 talks. 
so we don't know how big this one will be, but uh, we're just hoping this is uh, the restart of the biannual sequence. Indeed, okay, uh, great. Then um, Dominic, if you're ready to send us into the, um, into the breakout rooms, I'm going to stop the recording and I will see you all in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the second part of today's session. Uh, Stefan already has shared his slides. So our um, second speaker today is uh, Stefan Napo, Professor of Economics in Bayreuth in the state of Bavaria, uh, where they have uh, very great rules for securing the IT systems, he told us earlier, so, but he still managed to get here, which is wonderful. Um, so you, you may know some of Stefan's work about um, power indices in, in voting games and these kind of things uh, quite often um, with uh, special attention to how this plays out in decision making for very various European uh, decision making bodies. And today he's also going to talk about these kind of things about influence and manipulation in uh, weighted committee voting. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Okay, welcome back everyone and many thanks for having me. Uh, I try to give a 20 minute trailer of joint work with uh, Sasha Kurz and Alex Meyer, who's also in the audience. Um, that work has been going on for years, so it will be a challenge. We are still not bored, but, uh, but you'll see. So I guess in this audience, everybody will have seen a committee scenario like this, where we have uh, 14 people divided into three homogeneous groups, having strict preferences over five alternatives, A to E. Uh, and then assuming sincere voting, you find with this example and others similar to that, that uh, it very much depends on the voting rule, who will be uh, the winner uh, of whatever uh, this committee decides on. And with enough knowledge exposed, you might reverse engineer what is the favorite voting rule uh, you want to implement, assuming you're in one of the groups and, and happen to be the chair or be able to influence what voting rule is used. So that's known, but typically voting rules are adopted before preferences are known or before the applicants to some job or the candidates for some prize uh, are made public. Uh, and the question then is, what voting rule should you impose from an a priori perspective if you are a member of the large group or the small group? So more generally, we are motivated by the question of what are the a priori implications of different voting rules uh, like border plurality runoff and so forth for the success or influence of voters or the manipulation incentives when stakeholders have different vote shares. So that the answer should matter in particular for uh, shareholders meetings where you naturally have asymmetry, but also for councils, supervisory boards, all types of committees where you have a fixed group structure like a parliament uh, where the where strict party discipline. Um, we of course need not the first to ask about this, I mean, the, the relationship between uh, voting weights and quotas, voting rules, et cetera, and voting power. There's a large literature uh, on that dating back to Shapley and Schubig, Penrose, Bansov, various other indices of voting power and related success analysis. But the limitation there is that almost all the work is looking at binary votes or extensions that never really went beyond plurality. Um, voting rules have been compared with respect to uh, the manipulability, um, but that analysis has uh, mostly been focused on symmetric voters, sort of leaving out the element of weighted voting. So we try to contribute to these two literatures by relaxing the binary here and relaxing the symmetry there. Um, I try to keep the presentation short and, and, and colorful, but just a little bit of notation. So voters want to N, M alternatives, and we're focusing attention on strict preferences uh, combined to preference profile vote P. And then uh, we study only deterministic voting rules uh, with yield some winner A star for every profile. Uh, so we have formally speaking a mapping from the set of preference profiles to uh, a winner uh, respectively and, uh, and looking at the standard, we'll be looking at standard rules like plurality border uh, or Copeland as one condorcet rule where you sort of go for the alternative that wins the most pairwise uh, comparisons. Um, the first thing to note is that when we add weights uh, to an anonymous voting rule, we are sort of constructing a new mapping, which is 
uh, yeah, replicating preferences of a given voter. This is assuming integer weights, uh, which is convenient, and you might generalize, try to generalize to rational weights, no problem. Um, and then we call this beast here, this combination of a voting rule and a weight vector W, a weighted committee game or simply a weighted committee. So a given voter's preferences are simply counted multiple times because the voter owns multiple shares or is the party with having control over a number of seats or some group leader uh, or has a certain number of uh, uh, I mean, drawing rights in the IMF, et cetera, et cetera. As you may have seen from binary voting, um, uh, this is just extended to uh, more complicated social choice rules. Now two committees can look very different uh, at first look because they involve a different voting rule, say border versus plurality with runoff, and they may even involve uh, different voting weights, uh, but they could still amount to the very same and will be called equivalent if they induce the very same mapping between um, yeah, preference profiles and outcomes. And that is very handy then if you can find out that two voting rules are really equivalent uh, when looking at this and this mapping as a whole, because then they obviously come with an identical power distribution, identical distribution of preference satisfaction or success, manipulation opportunities, strategic voting equilibria, liability to paradoxes, uh, and so forth. Um, so there's a long tradition in the binary case for studying the equivalence uh, of different committees or different uh, vote vectors if we're looking at weighted voting games, which is a subclass of all simple voting games um, that dates back to the work from, uh, of von Neumann and Morgenstern. Shapley has contributed to that and others. Uh, it's it's non-trivial uh, discrete mathematics and, uh, and, and sort of the computations quickly explode, but nonetheless, we find it uh, even more fascinating in, in the non-binary case and the binary case and have spent quite a bit of time of our own and, and of our computers uh, on trying to figure out equivalence classes, the number of equivalence classes uh, that all involve border rules with three voters, three alternatives and so forth. I don't want to get into much detail, but just mention that uh, there's only really four Copeland or Condorcet committees when you have three voters and any number uh, of alternatives greater than two. And uh, they're here indicated uh, in, the, uh, in the unit simplex of relative voting weights. Uh, so all committees that involve positive voting weights of all three voters less than 50%, this yellow area, they're essentially the same as having one vote for each voter. Uh, everything up here in the blue makes sort of the relevant player a dictator and so forth. So that's just really four different Copeland committees, whereas there's already six distinct plurality committees. And in particular, in this mid range, you see that there's really a difference between plurality uh, and Copeland, how voting weight is or will be translated uh, into outcomes. Uh, the corresponding pictures become a lot more fancy for other rules, especially border or other scoring rules more generally, uh, where we already have 51 equivalence classes, even when we restrict the attention to just three alternatives. Uh, and, and sort of uh, one can figure out the, uh, the respective boundaries between equivalence classes, meaning that when you increase the voting weight of or decrease the voting weight of voter three from one downwards, you, you sort of switch exactly into a new equivalence class as you pass one of these lines uh, and approach uh, one third, one third, one third, for instance. And one can zoom in uh, yet more closely, sort of look at this triangle where voter one has the greatest voting weight, then voter two, then voter three. Uh, one can devise a map, and this is quite laborious, but, but uh, we still found it uh, interesting enough. Uh, you can do a map where you have all the weight distributions uh, amongst three voters and can sort of look up uh, what is the corresponding minimum integer representation. So for instance, if you look at uh, all weight configurations in that uh, quadrangle, uh, they all equivalent, they all amount to voter one having five votes on the largest voters, uh, looking at sort of isomorphism classes. Uh, so five votes for the first voter, two for the others respectively. And if you move within this class, so you changed uh, the, the number of shareholdings, uh, this will not have any effect as long as you stay in uh, within this area, whereas it would have an effect uh, with the trivial 
change of voting weights if you are in a, in a sort of singleton equivalence class of voting weights. So this would be all border committees. And yeah, the yet open question is what happens if you move between the classes uh, as regards the power distribution or the distribution of success uh, amongst the voters, which committee would you like to choose from an a priori perspective if you are the, uh, the chair or what happens if you choose a different rule, you move from border to, um, to just plurality or pairwise comparisons. Uh, and uh, you might also ask for rules that have nice properties in terms of relating power as closely as possible to the weights. Um, and uh, for this, we need or you one needs a power index similar to those that we already know for the binary case. And our favorite idea was exactly to uh, generalize known indices for binary voting games, uh, the Penrose Bansov index, the Sheppy Schubik index, um, to our setting. In the binary case, influence of a voter I is quantified as the expected sensitivity of the outcome to voter I's preferences or vote. Uh, so this corresponds to the odds that a different vote of voter I for any realized preferences um, would have made a difference. Um, these indices then, I mean, they all share this, this interpretation. Um, they have different axiomatic justifications and fundamentally they really differ in respect to or with respect to the, uh, prefer uh, the distribution you know, assumptions on preferences. If you make the impartial culture assumption of all voter preference being perfectly independent, um, then you end up with the Penrose Bansov -Bans index. The impartial culture assumption corresponds to the Shapley Schubik index. And we suggest to do the same also for social choice rules rather than just binary uh, voting games. Um, in other words, the suggestion is to deduce a, a measure of power from a simple thought experiment. You draw a preference profile at random from some pre-specified distribution, identify the outcome, look at the perturbation of a given voter I's preference, identify the resulting new winner. And if they differ, then uh, you figured out that at that profile, voter I is a swing voter uh, and therefore has influence in that committee. Um, and uh, you can do this overall or take expectations over all preference profiles then to estimate uh, or come up with a measure of the a priori voting power of uh, the corresponding player. These preference perturbations, they can have different interpretations. Uh, we're not really taking a stance there. The, the key premise behind the suggestion to quantify power in this way for social choice rules is that the committee members input to the decision-making process or to the outcome matters more, the more influential the guy is and vice versa. Um, and if you do the, if you do take the, adopt the IC assumption uh, of all preference profiles being equally likely, so all individual preferences being uh, equiprobable and independent of each other, then you get a natural generalization of the Penrose Bansov index with a sort of clear cut interpretation uh, that if the corresponding expectation uh, is 0.25, this means that on average 25% of voter eyes preference variations will change the outcome. And uh, if, if, if it's less for some other voter, we would consider that other voter correspondingly less uh, influential. Um, it's natural, we find, to normalize this number further because for more than two alternatives, there's many of the perturbations that will never change the outcome, even if play I is dictator and the most powerful uh, decision maker you can imagine. Uh, for, for a given uh, setting, um, because sort of perturbations that only change the, bo the bottom ranked alternatives uh, will not matter uh, for what the dictator uh, imposes. So uh, it, it feels natural to normalize uh, such that a dictator has a power of one. And so if you have power index PBI and those months of index 0.5, this means the player lies halfway between the null player uh, and the dictator player. Uh, and, uh, and, and get sort of a nice interpretation uh, of power. And if you do the IAC assumption instead of the IC assumption, you generalize uh, the Shapley Schubert index uh, in analogous fashion. Um, sorry, let me look into the chat. Okay, 
come back to that, I think. Uh, so when you have constructed such measures, you can apply them, for instance, to the International Monetary Fund, which is a heavy user of weighted voting because voting rights uh, are a monotonic function of drawing rights, which uh, measure contributions to the fund. And uh, there was a reform of these voting weights or these quotas in 2016, um, which one might study and quantify the effects on how China's power increased relative to the power of EU members or the US, etc. cetera. Um, what, what is perhaps more interesting, because you really need the indices that, that we constructed rather than the Penrose bunch of in, in the old form, uh, the Chevy Schubert is the selection of the managing director. It was clarified in 2016 that at least in theory, uh, sort of Kristalina Giagheva before Christine Lagarde, they should have been selected from a short list of three candidates by a majority of the votes cast, where votes are asymmetric across uh, the voters. And um, the authorization of majority is left open and you can sort of then think of different possibilities, what this might mean and compare them with regard to their influence uh, ramification. Uh, and I'm sparing you a closer look at these numbers, but just summarize that it turns out that the plurality interpretation of majority, so relative majority, actually maximizes the US influence on decisions, minimizes uh, it for all the others. Um, and perhaps even more interesting, the influence difference as you compare these three rules with one another for any given board member, they're actually bigger for most members than the effect of, uh, of this quota reform overall, which has been in the making for more than a decade. So they're haggling uh, a lot over things that actually matter less, at least for this managing director decision, than clarifying what they mean by a majority. Uh, one can do other things, try to identify biases. Is, is it true that plurality is always nicest for the largest vote in terms of influence? You can try to give rule max, uh, recommendations uh, if you are a chair and you want to maximize the influence of voter one in the committee with three members deciding here on fit four alternatives. You could look at this map and figure out, ah, it's, it, it will maximize influence to adopt border rule or some other rule. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, I directly move on to further possibilities, voter success or expected utility uh, could be studied. And we've done so. This is non-interesting in the binary case because the power is just a linear transformation uh, of, of, uh, of success and vice versa. It's not the case for three or more alternatives, but uh, another uh, and a focus on that issue would be manipulability. You know, some of you know the Kelly index gives the probability of tainted profiles such that some voter could gain from lying or one minus the Kelly index would be the probability that sincere voting is an Nash equilibrium. Uh, and that has been studied, of course, well, very well, but only for the symmetric case. So these 24% uh, is what you find in the literature and there's numbers also for much higher N and M. This we cannot really do for computation reasons, but, but we find, and this is new, uh, is that uh, the performance of border with respect to manipulation under IC, this is the picture for impartial culture, is much worse actually than uh, it is already for uh, symmetric voters. And this differs very much from other voting rules, for instance, plurality, which is much less prone also under asymmetric voting weights than border. Uh, and uh, one can do all sorts of exercises like trying to find out the voting rule that is least prone to manipulation. It turns out to be plurality runoff amongst the four rules here considered. Uh, I remember Bill asking me, what's the intuition for that? And I still cannot give you a good answer. Uh, the second stage of plurality runoff in the runoff, you of course don't want to manipulate, never, uh, but still why it's so good. Uh, I'm lacking intuition, maybe someone of you has it, but this is, this is the finding we get. And uh, I think my five minutes that Ulle mentioned in the chat uh, are over. Uh, so to conclude, um, I think we're all aware that the voting procedure matters for given preferences. And there are sort of famous cases, the US Civil War, the decision uh, on the elections that later on led to the US Civil War, the Tavara Inspector, or the, the big decision between Bonn and Berlin, uh, uh, making Trump the Republican candidate. Etc. What is our point, or what's what's the message of this project? Is there's also an a priori effect that can be quantified uh, on all these uh, on all these issues. So with that, thank you for your patience. I hope I wasn't too quick. 
uh, if you uh, want the sort of papers that, that this is based on and, and then work on progress, I can keep, keep you updated if you like. Thanks. Thank you very much. Unmute yourselves and let's clap. All right. Um, I see one question in the chat from Bill. Do you want to get started? Sure. In, in the case of uh, the binary case, simple voting games, there are famously examples where the uh, minimal integer weights are non-unique. Right. Um, and so one might uh, wonder whether this phenomenon is more or less common when you move away from the from the binary case. I'm wondering whether you came up. You, you talked about the minimal integer weights yes. for each of those regions of your diagram, but you didn't mention whether or not they, they were unique in the cases you saw or more generally. In the case where we, I mean, I, I mean, Zasha's quotes would be the expert, but as far as I remember, they were all unique. I mean, in the binary case, I think you need like seven voters or eight voters to get the non-uniqueness. Uh, and we, we only have these minimal integer uh, representation for rather small cases. Uh, so in that sense, I expect the representation to be non-unique in general, uh, but, uh, but not yet for uh, three voters, three alternatives. So, it would be interesting if it, if whether the probability of coming up with a non-unique one were higher in the, in the um, social yeah. choice setting than in the binary setting. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, we even found a phenomenon, I mean, this is still very recent uh, and, and needs to be looked into, but uh, when we're thinking about not border, but general weighted scoring rules where you have three alternatives and the middle ranked alternative gets, gets score S and the, the best rank gets a one, uh, the least a zero. Uh, there are mappings, so there are weighted scoring committees where the S has to be sort of an irrational number and there's no integer representation whatsoever. Um, so, so we have, I mean, we try to classify all weighted scoring committees, which, which are sort of in between plurality and anti-plurality, having border in the middle for three alternatives. Um, and, uh, and there's a weird phenomenon of, of sort of irrational or irregular uh, weighted scoring committees, but this we have to explore. I mean, non-uniqueness, we didn't investigate much, but, but this issue, there's not, there's not any integer representation. Um, and that's for a fixed number of voters? That's, that's for three voters, yes. Three voters, three alternatives. Where you, I mean, you have non-integer weights and uh, I mean, you have irrational weights that combine with an irrational score for the mid-ranked alternative and that defines a unique mapping from the preference profiles. Oh, and that that's cannot not be reproduced by any integers. Seems counterintuitive to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'll keep you posted. Okay. Do we have more questions? Uh, you can think about it. Raise your hand if, if you do. I'm just going to ask something uh, quickly, or maybe a complicated. This. So you said you did something where you looked uh, at everything from plurality to anti plurality by, by changing the middle weight. Yes. So, uh, Maybe yeah, from, from looking at the spectrum of who's like this, or maybe some other spectrum, do you have some understanding of um, where the number of equivalence classes comes from? So you, I don't remember the numbers, but they were different for border and plurality. And uh, I think for plurality, for border was many more. So is border the highest in this spectrum or is, and is that no. obvious so, I mean, or? Yeah, so the, I mean, as you raise the score that you attach to the mid-ranked alternatives, uh, which is, I mean, sort of from one for anti-plurality to zero, low way to zero for, for plurality, and border has one half in the middle. Uh, the number of equivalence classes is, is very steeply M-shaped. Uh, so it's very, very low at the end. So with just five uh, anti-plurality classes and six plurality classes, there's 51 border classes. This is all talking about three alternative three voters. And in between, we get up to 229 different classes for, for this mid rank value being like 0.9 uh, or 0.7. Um, and even the possibility that square root uh, of one half <laughs> is still yet something different, which, this, which generates a certain number of classes. 
the, the deeper mechanism, I mean, intuitively sort of non-round numbers, uh, they give rise to a lot of more combinations of how, uh, of, of which scores can arise for the alternatives as you combine them with weights. Uh, so at a very coarse level, it, it is intuitive that with border, where you have this, you have a one, you have a one half, uh, you can do more different combinations than with plurality or anti-plurality where you just have ones and zeros. Uh, but then the more precise workings of this, um, this, is, this is still a bit obscure. I mean, we, we have now figured out a way, or Zasha uh, gets deserves the credit for this, um, to exactly get all weighted scoring committees. Not, I mean, originally we just varied the, the parameter for the middle alternative in, in steps of a hundreds or so, uh, but you cannot be sure that you're missing, that you're not missing anything. And in fact, we did because of this irregularity problem. Um, but, but why, I mean, this M is not perfectly symmetric. Uh, so there's fewer equivalence classes in between plurality and border than there is between border and anti-plurality. Why this is so, uh, and, uh, yeah. Um, maybe maybe uh, someone in the audience has ideas. Maybe our next uh, questionnaire. Has it, has yes, thank you for your presentation. I'm puzzled what is the connection between what you are doing here and what is happening in work of Stefan Brahms of about 20 years ago, which provided a geometrical interpretation of um, proportional rules, so weighted rules, um, similar to the border rules, but which arbitrary intermediate weights. And then calculating how many different outcomes there could be for okay. such rules if you vary the parameters. So I'm not sure whether you well, are I mean, familiar. Maybe, maybe, I mean, I'm not familiar with Steve Rams' work with that, but Donald Sari has, has his triangles mm -hmm. where, where he's, he's doing that and, and having a line connecting plurality and anti-plurality. Maybe, maybe I'm confusing Sari and Brahms, in, but... <laughs> uh, in, in the simplex. Uh, yes. And, uh, and the, the, the key difference is that they would be looking at a fixed preference profile. And for one given profile, uh, then sort of track uh, who, who could be the respective scoring winner. Um, and in a way, we are doing this, but taking the union over all preference profiles that might arise. Uh, as, as, we, as we, I mean, it's not yeah. exactly the same, but we are sort of- but That means that uh, you're not comparing the outcome at a single point, but comparing the, the outcome over the entire exactly. distribution. Yes. So, I mean, a given scoring vector will introduce a mapping from the list of all preference profiles to the outcomes. So uh, we are taking this entire mapping for a given for rule like border and compare it to what happens if the mid-ranked alternative doesn't get one half, but uh, one half plus epsilon. And this makes a huge difference in, in terms of the mapping uh, by itself, but then also the mapping interacts with the weights that you give to players. And this question of how many different committees there are that relates to how many weights to the players, not scores to the mid-ranked alternative, but sort of big shareholders versus small shareholders, uh, how many different shareholding configurations, you could say, are actually distinct in terms of the decisions that they produce. So this number okay. 51 will be saying there's only 51 different weight distribution or share distribution in a, in a traded corporation that really differ if there's three shareholders. Okay, okay. I, Thanks. yeah. I, if there's a quick question from uh, anybody else, we will still uh, take it. Um, if that is not the case, then thank you very much once more, uh, Stefan. And then uh, I would like to ask Bill to tell us a little bit what's going to happen next month. I hear it's going to be something rather special. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, 
So the next two seminars, um, uh, we're gonna mix it up a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit different. We made a call to everyone on the distribution list um, asking for volunteers. Do any of you have an older paper that uh, perhaps never garnered the attention you thought it deserved? Maybe um, you were expecting some papers that uh, pushed forward from the door that you opened and uh, it didn't get it. That would be one example. Um, based on the enthusiastic responses, we've put together two sessions we're calling Oldies But Goodies. Um, those are the sessions for April and for May. Each session will have four speakers, but the speaking time will be less, so the total time will be the normal amount for this seminar. Uh, and for the April seminar, uh, the speakers will be Jean-Francois Lallier, Mark C. Wilson, Jérôme Lang, and Hervé Moulin. For May, it'll be Anik Laruel, Lirong Ja, Reshaf Meir, and Clemens Pupa. So I look forward uh, to seeing all of you uh, for the next two seminars, which will be a little bit different. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm also looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to seeing all of you again uh, very soon. Then, so bye-bye. <laughs>